Hello and welcome to this session in which we would look at transfer prices. I'm going to be explaining transfer prices from the concept of performance measurement rather than tax perspective. I do have the tax perspective in my international accounting course. So if you are looking for transfer prices as it affect the tax, please Google or YouTube Farhat transfer tax and you will find my lecture. The reason we're doing transfer taxes is because in the prior session, we looked at decentralization in a company. And when a company is decentralized, what's going to happen is each division will be judged based on return on investments, economic value added, and residual income. So transfer prices is important because when one division sells to another division, the selling price of division A will be the cost of division B. So that's why it's going to affect their performance measurement. And this is how I'm going to be explaining transfer prices. Now, before I start, I would like to remind you that if you are an accounting student or a CPA candidate, please check out my website, farhatlectures.com, for additional resources, especially if you're studying for your CPA exam. This topic is covered on the CPA exam. I don't replace your CPA prep course. I don't replace your CPA review course, whether you're taking Becker, Roger, Guiley, Glam, or any other course. I can be a useful addition. I can be that vitamin, that supplement that's going to add 10 to 15 points to your exam because I do explain the materials and details. I don't assume any prior knowledge. And basically, my offer to you is this. Are you willing to try my system for $30 a month for just to try it? To see if you could improve your grade on the CPA exam. Simply put, your risk is $30. Your potential gain is passing the exam. Simply put, your potential gain is unlimited if you want to quantify it. And I, I'm, I, you don't have to invest thousands of dollars with my course. You try it. $30. You like it. You keep it for the next month. You don't. You cancel. Life goes on. And if not for anything, check out my website to determine how well your university is doing on the CPA exam. This is a list of all the courses that I cover. Please link with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so. Check out my LinkedIn recommendation to see how students use my system to pass the CPA exam. Please like this recording and share it with others on YouTube. Connect with me on Instagram and Facebook. So let's go back to transfer prices. And what's the issue with transfer prices? Again, as we said, we might have various divisions that they sell to each other. And as a result, we might have what we called agency problem, where internal prices between divisions are set to benefit the managers of the division rather than the company as a whole. What does that mean? It means the manager is making decision based on prices to benefit themselves, not the firm. This is what basically agency problem is. So part of transfer transfer prices, it it could amount to an agency problem. So simply put, we're going to be working with the selling division. And when the selling division sells, they, they record the transaction as if they sold it to an external customer. Let's assume they're selling milk. We, are, we have farmers. And they're selling to another division in the company where they produce the cheese. So they need the milk to produce the cheese. So those are the two divisions that we are dealing with in this example. Okay. And when they purchase from this division, from the milk division, they record the transaction as if they purchase the items from an external, from an external supplier. Although both of these companies are under the umbrella of one parent company. So this is where transfer prices occur. They are in the same, under the same umbrella. Now, transfer. So what is a transfer price? Simply put, the transfer price is the price that the milk division charges to the cheese division. They have to assign a value to the goods and services. Simply put, if they don't assign a value, let's assume they give it to them at cost, then the milk division was, would no longer be considered a profit center. It will be considered a cost center. Then it will be evaluated differently. We are assuming that the milk division is a profit center. This means they produce revenues and they incur expenses. Therefore, when they sell to the cheese division, that is an expense for them. That's a cost of goods sold. So it's the amount used by each division to record the event. Now, why is this important? Why? Because if we are saying the milk and the cheese division, they belong to the same company. So why do we care about transfer prices? Because at the end of the day, what we care about is the whole company overall. Well, if we are a profit division, we have to make decisions about revenues and expenses. We have to cost the product. How much should we charge for the product? Because our division's performance 
in the eyes of the corporate uh, of the main, uh, the corporate means the main company will matters whether we are making profit a lot of profit a little bit or none okay so because they're going to evaluate our performance based on residual income return on investments and economic value added if you don't know what these terms are look in the prior session because those we already covered those when we covered decentralization basically we are being evaluated based on our performance and of course transfer prices is extremely important for tax purposes think about when one company has many divisions in different countries and that matters substantially now because now it's affecting the bottom line of the company but again as i told you at the beginning of this recording i do not discuss tax consequences please go to my international accounting course and you will see what are the tax consequences when it comes to transfer prices now the best way to illustrate the idea of transfer prices is to walk you through an example and i'm going to be using the farm which is the milk as the selling division and the cheese producers is the buying division and those two companies they're under the same corporate umbrella so let's start with the first example as we said is we have a buying division and a selling division and we are selling barrels of milk to the buying division which is the cheese manufacturing company so what is the profit for the selling division well the profit for the selling division when they sell to the cheese division it's whatever they charge them which is going to be calling the transfer price whatever they charge the buying division minus cost of goods sold remember cost of goods sold could be variable cost fixed cost a combination but for this for the sake of simplicity we're going to say the transfer price minus cost of goods sold so let's assume our cost to produce the barrel of milk is twenty dollars we're going to sell it for thirty five dollars therefore the profit for the selling division is fifteen dollars simply put the transfer price minus cost of goods sold will give us fifteen dollars for the selling division now what is the buying division profit well we're going to assume that the buying division can sell the cheese the final product that they're producing at 40 at, at 100 dollars well it's going to cost them 35 dollars from the uh, from the selling division for the milk then they're going to have to incur an additional 40 dollars in cost as a result they're going to make a profit of one of 25 which is 100 minus 35 minus 40 minus 35 minus 40 remember the 35 is coming from the selling division therefore they're going to make a profit of 25 dollars so let's take a look at the company overall what happened for the for the company overall for this company overall sales revenue is the sales only to the external party which is the 100 dollar minus the cost of goods sold in the selling division minus the additional cost which is 100 minus 20 minus 40 equal to 40 dollars so notice the profit for the whole firm is the profit of the seller's profit the 15 dollars plus the buyer's profit which is 25 dollars so it doesn't matter 40 dollars for the whole company 15 dollars for four was for the selling division 25 dollars was for the buying division let's change the scenario a little bit just to get to start to have a feeling the effect of the transfer pricing let's assume cost of goods sold for the selling division still 20 but they happen to charge 60 dollars so what's the profit for the selling division well the profit for the selling division now is 40 dollars they sold it for 60 their cost is 20. let's take a look at the buying division it's the the manufacturing facilities where they produce the cheese they're going to sell it to the external customer for 100 dollars they're going to have to account for 60 dollars for the milk they're going to have to incur an additional 40 dollars therefore their profit is zero because 100 minus 60 minus 40 will give you a profit of zero they will break even let's take a look at the company overall the company overall it does not really matter we count the sale for the external party which is 100 dollars minus cost of goods sold in the selling division in the in the farm on the farm to produce the milk My, uh, uh, minus minus 40 dollars additional cost therefore the total profit is 40 dollars still it's the seller's profit 40 and the buyer's profit is zero so notice what happened the company overall was not affected however under this scenario the milk producing division would look very profitable they will get all the resources their managers get all the bonuses while the cheese producing division they would look they are barely making any money actually they're not making any profit 
Let's switch the scenario a little bit. Cost of goods sold is 20 for the milk division. They sold it for $20. What will be their profit? Their profit will be zero. Now here's what's going to happen. In the cheese division, they're going to sell it for $100. They're going to have to, they, they account for $20 from the milk division. They incur $40 in additional cost. Therefore, the profit is 100 minus 20 minus 40. Their, pro, their profit is $40. Now it's the opposite. The milk division would look like they are not making any profit. Therefore, they will not get any additional resources or bonuses. The cheese division here will get the bonus because they are making all the profit for the company. But notice what's happening here. Hopefully, you're, you're catching on that it's $40, but how we split that $40 matters. How split this $40 matter? So the question is, what should be the optimal transfer price? And what's the optimal transfer price? It's what's the best price that they should charge each other the milk and the cheese division. So the transfer price that leads both division to make decisions that are in the best interest of the firm. Now, we kind of, kind of we know, as long as we can keep it between certain amount, we're going to find out what certain amount is, both party will be happy. So the transfer price between the both division, what should be that optimal price? It seems to be between 20 and 60, okay, as an optimal price. Why? Because anything above 20, Anything above 20, the milk division will make profit, okay, up to 60. If they charge more than $60, if they think about it, if they charge more than $60, if they charge $62, let's assume they charge $62, they will make more profit. But what's going to happen, the cheese division, they will they will be at a loss of $2. So it seems 20 to $60 seems to be an optimal price. That seems to be. However, in the real world, we have to take into account other consideration. Here we're going to be introducing the idea of external market. So in the real world, the, um, we're going to also make an assumption we could have a perfect intermediate market or no intermediate market. What does intermediate market and no intermediate market means? Intermediate market means there is a market price for this product that we are selling and we can sell it on outsider. No intermediate market means there is no market price. Simply put, if you remember, we can sell the selling division, they can sell the milk to the cheese manufacturing company, or they can sell the milk to a third party. Also, the cheese division, they can get their supply from somewhere else. So here what's happening, we have a perfect intermediate market, where if you don't, if, if I don't like your prices, I can go somewhere else. If I don't like your prices, I can sell it somewhere else. If I don't like your prices, I can supply myself from somewhere else. So let's talk about how, what would happen under intermediate market and no intermediate market. So what is are the features for intermediate market? So simply put, buyers can buy any quantity without affecting the price. It means there's plenty of supply. The seller can sell any quantity without affecting the price. So simply put, there's plenty of supply and demand. It's not an issue. It's not going to affect the price. Both buyers and sellers are price setters. Simply put, price setters means the market sets the price. So there is a market price and both of them, they want, they want this market price. They don't want to pay more or less. So what will be the optimal price if we have an intermediate market? Well, the answer is it's the market price. If we have an intermediate market for the product, the best price for both parties in the, is the intermediate price. Now, why would why would that be the case? Let's think about it. And let's think about it. Well, if we charge them, let's assume the the selling company, the milk division, sells low. Um, if the price is lower, okay. Let's assume. Let's assume the price, let, let, let's work an example let, on, on the next page. Let's assume the market price is $35. It's better to explain it with numbers. Assuming the market price is $35, here's what's going to happen. The profit for the selling division will be, if the cost of goods sold is 20, the transfer price is 35, then their profit is 15. So guess what? The selling division, any price, 35 or above, which is the market price, they will accept it. Why? Because let's assume the cheese division, they're willing to pay 38. Oh, the milk division will be very happy. They will supply as much as they can. Let's assume the cheese division wants to buy it for 33. Well, the milk division, they would say, no, I'm sorry. We're not going to sell it to you at 33 because we can sell it for 35. So notice, if they sell it, more than the market price, they're going to be very happy. 
if they sell it less than the market price, they won't sell it less than the market price to the cheese company to supply them because they can sell it somewhere else at 35. There's plenty of supply, plenty of demand for that price. And this is what we meant by any lower supplier will go outside. The suppliers will not supply less than 35. Any higher, and let's think about it from the cheese manufacturing facility. If the milk division wants to charge them $38, they will not accept. Why not? Because they can go somewhere else and buy it for $35. If the cheese division charged them $34, they'll be, bring it on because they're saving a dollar from going to the outside. So simply put, in an intermediate market, the best price, that's what you need to know about intermediate market. This is the answer. What's the optimal price? The optimal price is the intermediate market price if we have an intermediate market because everyone is happy and there's no need for negotiation. There is no need for complication. Now we're going to look as if there is no intermediate market. So what does it mean no intermediate market? It means the product is so specialized that there is no market for it. If we want to look up the price, there is no price. Think about if we are producing screws for a machine and those screws are only for that specific machine. So there is no market price for them or the corporate the corporate division, the corporate uh, headquarter, they don't want us to buy and sell to an outsider. So any external buying and selling is banned. We have to purchase from our sister companies. Why? because that's what the headquarter want us to do. So we're going to assume that the fixed cost is irrelevant in our decision and there are plenty of capacity. So we're not taking capacity in, into consideration. Look, if you are the seller, if you are the milk company, okay, your transfer price should not be less than the, than, than the variable cost. Think about it. What happened if, let's assume for that $20 for the milk company, let's assume for the sake of simplicity, this is their variable cost per barrel of milk. Well, guess what? They cannot sell it for less than 20 because if they sell it for less than 20, the more they produce, the more they lose. Why would you keep on losing, losing money? So they will not transfer if the transfer price for the seller for the milk division is less than $20. They have this incentive to sell and they will not transfer. Simply put, they will not do it because it will not make any sense unless the corporation wants to uh, subsidize them and they no longer become a profit center. We're assuming here you are a profit center. Now, what happened if the transfer price, if the transfer price, they're charging them some price greater than the final price minus the buyer variable cost. So we're going to assume the, the, the buyer variable cost is $40. So if they charge them any price above 60, which is the difference between the final market price. We're assuming the final market price is 100. We're still working with the same example, minus $40 that the cheese division will have to incur. If they sell it to them at 61, then, then guess what? Then the buyer would lose money. Why? Because if they sell it, they're going to sell it at 100. Their cost is 101. They're going to be losing a dollar. So anything above 60, they will not do it. So no transfer will take place any price greater than the fi final market price minus the buyer variable cost. So what is the best transfer price? The best transfer price is the seller's variable cost. Again, assuming we have enough capacity and we're assuming it's $20, it means we should only charge the milk division should only charge $20. You might be saying, why not? Why shouldn't they charge up to $60? What's going to happen is this. The lower the price from the milk division, remember, we're assuming the final selling price is 100. Okay. True. Today, the final market price is 100, but that's a market price. What happened if this price goes down to 60 or go down to 80? Okay. If we, if we sell it to them at 60, they have to incur an additional $40, then they are losing. Okay. Because now the market price is 80. So this way, if we provide it to them at $20, they have the widest range of pricing power. So if the price went down, the cheese division would still make money. Because remember, now we cannot sell it on outsider. Therefore, if we cannot sell it, the really we're not making any profit here. Just basically, we are kind of supplying only our company. So simply put, it would look something like this. Cost of goods sold is $20. Actually, we would love any price above 20, but we will not do that. We charge the best is to charge them only $20. And the buying division would absorb any price up to $60. But you don't want to do that. You want to give the company 
you want to transfer the milk at a price of twenty dollars okay and remember they're gonna add forty dollars to it therefore the cost will be sixty okay now for the company as long as the final price for the whole company is above sixty the company is happy the firm is profitable overall okay well if the if the selling price is exactly sixty we are breaking even any selling price less than 60 should be, uh, I'm sorry, should be greater than 60. Oh, this is selling price. Selling price less than 60. Well, if the selling price is less than 60, it doesn't matter. The company will not make any profit. Therefore, we assume there are no transfer. So that's why the best transfer price is the variable cost of the selling division. So give it to them at 20. This gives the company overall the widest range of selling prices because this price of 100 might drop. And if it drops, you want to give the cheese division enough pricing power, enough pricing power so they can still make a profit. And the company overall will be making a profit because the final product that we're selling is cheese, not milk. That's the assumption, not, that's the, not the assumption, that's the implied assumption here that we want to make profit on the cheese, not the milk. At the end of this recording, I'm going to ask you to like this recording, share it, and once again, if you are a CPA candidate, please check out my website, forhatlectures.com. Also, if you are an ACCA candidate or a CMA candidate, or obviously an accounting student, I have plenty of resources that's going to help you with your courses. Study hard, good luck, and of course, most importantly, stay safe.